Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Well, I had a hope for tonight that, like many hopes, get, has been cruelly dashed. But I know the reason. And the reason is freedom. And I want to talk to you tonight about the joys and perils of freedom. Probably not so much about the joys, but definitely about the perils. And uh, I want to speak prophetically a little bit tonight. So I just want to pray, Father, help me to convey what is beyond my own intellect and preparation so we hear what it is that you need to say in Jesus' name. Amen. Someone who I uh, greatly respect is a guy called Paul Scanlon who was the founding, um, well, I said the founding pastor of what has now become Life Church in Bradford that was Abundant Life. I say founding in the sense that he transitioned a work that he inherited into being something very different. And uh, uh, if you're interested, you should read not the story of what happened to get there rather than where there is because the story will give you a lot of insight into some of the challenges that are faced and that, uh, that we face. But Paul said one day, and I've, I've also read it, that without a complaint, there is no prophetic purpose. And the truth is prophets, and by prophets I don't mean you know, people who can explain revelations to you, um, or necessarily people who say, oh, I've got a word, this is what the Lord is saying, but people who have a prophetic mantle, a prophetic spirit, which is about seeing things and communicating things that are not necessarily or likely to be visible to the majority of people to whom you are communicating at the time because you're speaking not out of the obvious of what you see, but you're speaking out of what is revealed, that in that spirit, um, there is, it, it's often driven by a complaint that rises up. Something in your spirit that is frustrated, unhappy with something, that then makes you speak out some things that, that are connected and, and related to that. And um, I have a complaint. Um, I have a complaint about some of the things that hurt, some of the things that I wish we weren't going through. Um, some of that's the elephant in the room that not everybody wants to talk about. Some people have left us. That's the elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about. Uh, but it's not off the menu. We should talk about it and can talk about it and uh, look at the reasons without trying to make excuses. Now, there is an issue that um, if you look at one of the classic historic stories in the Bible that was central to the history of Israel, you find something called the Exodus, which is when the children of Israel had spent 400 years in captivity or slavery to a system. That system was the system of Egypt. Um, if you look at the story, you will find that in spite of the hardships, <clears throat> they had become familiar with the process of life that that dictated. And uh, familiarity is a funny thing because familiarity will, will make us accept things because they are familiar. And um, the issue was that, that by an amazing act of God's kindness towards them, they had opportunity to leave that place of slavery. Now, um, that place may not have been perceived as slavery when you're in that thing for so long, sometimes you don't see it for what it is, but it was slavery and that needed to be brought to the fore. So in that leaving of of um, of that place of slavery, they entered into something they'd not experienced for a long time, which was a freedom, but they didn't really know how to define freedom. It's just they weren't in Egypt anymore. And if you track the story and you watch the story, you'll find something very fascinating happens, which is that freedom caused as many problems for them as slavery and bondage. Because the truth is we don't know how to handle 
freedom. We are uncomfortable with freedom. Now, we don't think we are. We all think we want freedom, but actually, freedom has destroyed as many people as bondage because you have to know how to handle freedom. Now, what's also fascinating is that as they left this long slavery to a system in Egypt by a whole process of miracles by which God was so clearly involved and also by the fact that God was actually leading them on this journey, you would have thought if God is leading them and they have had so many miraculous interventions, then everybody's going to be happy Everybody's going to be full of joy, and they're all going to skip and dance across to this place called the land of promise. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, instead of skipping and dancing and being joyful, they began very quickly to struggle with the challenges that this newfound freedom presented them and to try and evaluate what were the stuff that they had to resolve in the context of change within them. And so staggeringly, you find that um, of the generation that were established, for example, the key characters were Moses, Joshua, and Caleb. Those were the key characters. The issue is that only Joshua and Caleb actually made it out of that generation to where they were supposed to go, the others left in the process. Now you say, hang on a minute, they didn't leave, they died. Well, there's nothing more non-negotiable in the context of leaving than dying. You can't have a deeper leaving than if you die. But if you read the scripture, what happened is that on that journey, because of the struggles, those who were the compatriots of, 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 of these two guys, Joshua and Caleb, left, they died. Now, I say this to say this, can you imagine how painful that must have been for Joshua and Caleb? Because the kids they grew up with, the young people they worked with, the generation that they established their process with, all died. They all left. Till eventually only Caleb and Joshua remained in the context of the journey of going to the place that God was calling them to. Now, I say that because the elephant in the room can be we don't talk about stuff. I have to tell you, my heart, particularly I'll speak for myself, is extremely broken at the people who are no longer with us. I feel about that situation the same that I'm sure Caleb and Joshua felt as they were having funeral after funeral after funeral of things, of people that they knew and friends that they had and people that they had expected they would journey their whole life with. Now, that's not to be criticized critical of those who made it and, or those who didn't make it. It's just to point out the fact that there was a challenge that occurred in the transition that carries with it the risk that some people may not make it. Now, the worst of those is, and I'm going to speak this because I said I'm going to be prophetic and not have an elephant in the room. Imagine if you went home sometime this week and your wife, your husband your father, your mother, your son, your daughter, your grandson, your granddaughter weren't there. And there was no note, no letter to say what had happened. They just weren't there and you never saw them again or heard from them again. How do you think that you would feel in that situation? That's why I recommend to people all the time in my social media presence, pray for your pastors because 90% of leavings happen like that. You come to the house and suddenly those you love are not there anymore. No note, no letter, no explanation. So what it causes is grief. Now one of the reasons that we lack an element of joy in this place is because there is grief. There is grief because there is a funeral going on. It's the funeral of those we hoped would be with us for the rest of our lives and go with us together 
to what we wanted to achieve, but it hasn't happened. Now, there is mourning that goes with that, but there is a promise in Scripture that says, you've turned my mourning into dancing. You've caused me to put off my sackcloth. So there is a time where tears endure for a season, but joy comes in the morning. So this is not critical. It's just talking about the elephant in the room to say this is what happens and this is how people feel. But what causes it ultimately is freedom. So my point being, you would have thought with the word from God, with the miracles that happened and the confirmations, that the journey from Egypt to the place promised would be the easiest thing in the world. But it wasn't, okay? Now, thank God they made it. Thank God for grace. Thank God for love. And love covers all of this with us, but we needed to say that. So, I want to talk to you about freedom. See, true freedom is a spirit and not a state. That's part of the problem. Freedom is not a state that you live in, it's a spirit that you have. Now, if you live in a state of freedom, that's when the problem comes because most of these people who started the journey from Egypt to the land of promise entered a state of freedom but didn't have the spirit of freedom. Therefore, freedom became a problem because it was a state that you lived in, not a spirit that you had. The state of freedom only looks at, what can I do? I'm free. What can I do? Well, I'm going to do it. So the state of freedom is always looking at, well, now I'm free. What can I do? I can be where I want to be, not be where I don't want to be. Do what I want to do, not do what I don't want to do. But the spirit of freedom focuses on, what should I do? Now that I'm free, what should I do? What is it that I ought to do now that I'm free? That I could choose not to, but I know that I ought to. That's why the Apostle Paul, writing in twice in the book of Corinthians, chapter 6, and chapter 10, says these words, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. See, that's freedom. In freedom, everything is permissible. You can be, do, act, speak, say what you like. Everything is permissible, but Paul says, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but I will not be mastered by anything. In other words, there is a danger that goes along with freedom when we see it just as a state of being rather than a spirit by which we are owned and possessed that says, now I'm free, what should I do? See, freedom, being free from whatever, is a current, popular, and necessary subject matter. It has moved beyond major issues like the abolition of human slavery. Those were big issues, weren't they, about freedom? And resistance to foreign invading idealism, things like, you know, freedom, we resisted the Nazi attempt to overrun Europe and the world just to few decades ago and all that stuff, those were major issues, but now it's not so much those that concern us in the context of freedom, but it has become more personal issues. It becomes a self-focused assessment. So freedom becomes all about me. What I want to do, not what I ought to do. Who I want to be, not who I ought to be, how I want to act, not how I need to act. And so it's this inability to address this issue of freedom that starts to cause us so much problem. Freedom by its very nature is a problem. Let me explain why freedom is a problem. Because whatever it was that regulated behavior is now gone, and with that comes new difficult challenges. That's why I know some of you, and some of you who are not here, who could have been here, are struggling with what is happening because we have moved from a system where you may not have realized it, but nevertheless it was in place, where behavior was regulated. Now it was done in ways that you did not realize what it was that was being done. 
And it was not done with malice in the sense of, I'm going to use devious means to bring you under control. But the truth is, we like to have our behavior regulated. So there was a time when most of my preaching was clearly explaining to you what you ought to do and what you didn't ought to do, and what would be the rewards for doing what you ought to do, and what would be the cost for not doing what you ought to do. And there is not one of us in here tonight who is uncomfortable with that. We love it because it takes the responsibility away from us. We just have to accept and do. Monkey see, monkey do. Monkey hear, monkey say. But in freedom, where our behavior is not regulated, it poses for all of us this, this void, this, this, this place of, 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 that is no longer filled, and we start to feel empty. Now, one of the problems with this journey of these people called Israel was that they were free, but suddenly they realized they were free from the regulated life that they had lived in Egypt. And can you believe that they said to Moses, we want to go back to Egypt? You would say, how dumb is that? How can they possibly have ever said to Moses, we want to go back to Egypt? What is wrong with them? But you see, they soon forgot what Egypt represented in the void of now having to understand how freedom works. And so the only way that they could be brought into some kind of order was for God to institute something called the law. Because if he did not bring into the equation a set of behavioral controlling issues, they were never going to respond and have an opportunity to relate to the freedom that they had once brought. So God introduced the law three months into the journey to try and help settle that business, which was that we want our behavior regulating. Some of you are uncomfortable because we now no longer regulate your behavior. And we do not operate a system that says, if you do this, you'll get this. And if you don't do it, oh, you're going to get that. But you see, freedom does not operate on those kind of modems. So probably the most pertinent one that we face is the removal of the pressure to comply with or submit to a clearly defined set of rules based on what will happen if you do and what will befall you if you don't. Now let me tell you what happens in freedom when someone like me is not providing that. We tend to be influenced by the loudest voice or the strongest influence that will fill that void and we start to look for that. So when the children of Israel thought Moses was missing, they looked to fill the void. How are we going to fill the void? Well, let's build a golden calf. Why did they build a golden calf? Because calves represented the gods of the pagans who were around them. So if this god's not going to be what we expected this god to be, let's build the god that we were familiar with. And the danger is that some of you in the challenges of our journey want to melt down the gold and build the God that you were familiar with from where we were and what we were doing, just like with the children of Israel and Moses. And then somebody like me comes and smashes down the jolly golden calf and we can get all upset and say, that's me done because you smashed my golden calf, which should have never been built in the first place, but for which the person leading was responsible because you have left them with the void because now you are not leading according to the thing that we were familiar with, the challenges of freedom. Freedom also carries with it often unforeseen but well-documented consequences. There's nobody more equipped in here than our family to express to you that freedom carries with it often unforeseen but well-documented consequences. We almost lost a marriage because of freedom. We've had all kinds of stuff happen in our family because of freedom. Things that have the potential in their consequence to be so destructive that you don't make it through. And it was all a challenge that occurred initially and completely because of an interjection of kinds of freedom that we don't know how to deal with. 
So where systematic slavery produced violent oppression, freedom tends to produce self-indulgence and excess. That's the challenge we face. How do we still preach and live in freedom without it being interpreted for self-indulgence and excess that stops us from building community, loving each other, sharing our lives, giving of ourselves, because freedom says, I don't have to. But actually, true freedom in spirit says, but I need to. Freedom says, I don't want to. But true freedom says, but I ought to. And so we lay down our lives not to fulfill the things that are important to us primarily, but the things that are important to all that are really driven by the freedom that God has given us because Paul says it was for freedom that Christ set us free. And Jesus said, if you know the truth, it will make you free. And he said that if you, when, the, when the Son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. That's the question is, though, when we experience that freedom, do we know what to do with it? So here's the problem. Freedom relies more on self-regulation than institutional control. That's the problem right there. Freedom relies more on self-regulation than institutional control. But we have become so familiar in our lives with institutional control that we're not very good at self-regulation unless and I've got an unless in there because I want to talk about the unless. We're not good at self-regulation unless. I'm going to come to the unless in a moment after just sharing a scripture with you. Paul uses a historic event, the Apostle Paul, with which his audience is familiar, which is often Paul's style to refer them to something with which they were familiar, to illustrate a point about freedom. And he suggests what I've suggested to you, that what is evident from the ancient story of Israel's deliverance from the captivity and slavery in Egypt was their inability to deal with freedom and something that goes along with that called uncertainty. Okay? Freedom carries with it uncertainty. You can't have freedom without uncertainty. Because once the uncertainty is gone, you've come to a place of such security that you're probably now going to contract the freedom and put walls around it like the little, um, like the little cartoon that we show. Now you've become a believer. Here's the box. Get in that box and don't stray from the box. And so another of the things in the context of freedom that we struggle with is uncertainty because we're so desperate for things to be certain and fix, but freedom carries with it uncertainty. If you're not prepared to accept the uncertainty of all that you're seeing, then you'll never fully enter into the spirit of the freedom that is coming to you. And so what was it that caused the whole generation to leave, to die, to be gone, and all the problems? They couldn't handle the uncertainty that went with the journey. But if you're going to experience the freedom of the journey, you have to live in the uncertainty that goes along with it. Now, uncertainty doesn't mean insecurity, right? Our confidence is in God. And so Caleb and Joshua were not insecure, but they were uncertain because they were being led in a path they had never been before. One of the encouragements to Joshua when he was finally taking over the leadership from Moses and about to lead the children across the dividing line to take them into the promise was God says, be strong and courageous because you have never been this way before. So there was uncertainty but not insecurity. He was confident in what God was saying but uncertain about the detail. Why? Because you've never been this way before. So, so, as Paul's opening this thing, he, he suggests that what's evident from this ancient story of Israel's deliverance from the captivity and slavery in Egypt is their inability to deal with freedom and uncertainty. Namely, that they couldn't handle its challenges without messing up. And that if we are going to do it successfully, we should learn from their example. So, Paul clearly says they couldn't handle this challenge 
without messing up. So please learn from their example and don't mess up like they did. Now you say, well, where do you get that from? From Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And Paul writes to the church and says, I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers. And I love this in the NIV. I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact. Now, let me digress slightly just for one moment. Ignorance of the facts is a major contributor to the challenges of freedom. Ignorance of the facts is a major challenge, a major contributor to the challenges of freedom. Let me give you an example. And this is a little bit political, and I don't go there very often, but it's kind of apolitical in the sense that I'm not one side or the other. I just want to use it as an example. You could argue that the Brexit referendum was a wonderful example of the two sides of a coin that is anti-freedom. One side promises blessing beyond measure, beyond your wildest dreams, and probably beyond their ability to deliver, even to the point of putting it on a bus. But the other tries to control the outcome and commitment desired through fear, which is a form of intimidation. So on one side we've got promises, you come this way and life will just be absolutely amazing. The other side saying, if you don't do what we say you got to do, be afraid, be very afraid. Now thankfully, whether you agree with it or not, there are some people who said we are going to use freedom. And I propose to you that in a generation that is around now, they will not be intimidated by fear, nor fooled by false promises. But when both of those things come in, they are actually anti-freedom and not pro-freedom. Now, here's my problem. I'm all too familiar with these two approaches to control an outcome in church life and religion. They are the same. Oh, if you just do this, it's all going to be wonderful and rosy and there'll be so much and God's blessing's going to pour onto you so much that you just won't be able to stand it. And then the other side, if you don't do what we're telling you to do, if you don't live this way, if you don't react this way, if you don't respond, you need to be afraid because God is not going to smile on you. Judgment will be on you. You'll be under a curse. Both of those things are anti-freedom. See, some facts are not facts at all. So I like Paul's point here. I don't want you to be ignorant of the facts. There are some things that seem to be factual about the benefits of freedom that are not facts at all. Right? They are what we call in modern language, spin. Some facts are not facts at all, but what we now call spin... Stories manipulated to create a certain conclusion in the mind of the hearer often dominate over the facts. And then, of course, there's the other issue, that when we are convincing people about the decisions we've made in life, are the facts really the facts? Or is what you're being told spin to try and get you to believe something or come to a certain conclusion in your mind that is not reality. So I like what Paul says here about this story. He says, first of all, don't be ignorant of the facts. Get hold of the real facts, the true facts, the proper facts on everything, okay? And this is it, that our forefathers were all under the cloud. They all passed through the sea. They were all baptized in, into Moses in the cloud and the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, or in other words, his, his parallel is this. They were party to the same loving God, the same salvation, the same revelation, the same presence that you and I are. This is Paul's point. And he has to make that point because what he's about to say is don't make the mistake that they made when they were challenged with freedom. Make it different, okay? So he parallels that we are the same as them. And then he says, nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them and their bodies finished up scattered 
over the desert. Why? Because they didn't know how to get a hold of freedom and use it properly. So then he goes on to say in verse 6, now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil, heavy, onerous, difficult things as they did. And then in verse 11, he also says these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the age has come. You think Paul's trying to get across here that this example is important if you are going to understand the process of freedom and not die on the journey or leave on the journey or drop out on the journey that you were called to make and actually receive the inheritance that was always promised for you, do you think Paul's trying to emphasize a point here? These things happened as examples for us. And so these two men, Caleb and Joshua, are part of that process who rise to the top to take on themselves the, 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 the forward momentum of this thing, even in the midst of the pain that they were walking through, as I have already said, having watched all the people who left Egypt with them leave. Do you have the courage when you alone are left? Or would you say, well, we must be wrong because... See, transfer that now. These things occurred for our example. What if Caleb and Joshua said, we must be wrong because look at all these people who died. Look at who we lost on the way. Now, that, that wasn't an issue of disrespectfulness or dishonoring. I am absolutely sure that their hearts were pained because of the deep love and connection of that community. But the courage in Caleb and Joshua, to say, but we will go on, is that courage in us. So here's the deal. Numbers 14 verse 24 says this, and this is where I wanted to lead you to so we don't go on too long tonight. It gives us a little insight into why Caleb, and I could talk about Joshua as well, but I don't want to expand this too far from the boundaries that we are in, why they were not destroyed within the freedom that they were experiencing, why they didn't succumb to the same fate as everybody else, why they actually continued through to being the leaders, and, um, and good news for Eunice, 80 and 85 respectively, <clears throat> when they started this, crossing over. What was it that did that? Here's the key. Numbers 14 verse 24. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit. <clears throat> one, one, of the, one of the English words for that Hebrew word for different is the word alien. Not alien. Alien. So that's one of the words that when you, when you look in a Hebrew dictionary to say, one of the other words is to hold back. In other words, they were able to hold back from some of the excesses and the decisions and the distorted understanding and the incorrect facts that were causing so many others to lose their life. They were able to hold back from that. Why? Because their freedom actually freed them to get a proper assessment of what was going on and to commit themselves not to a process that they wanted but to something that was necessary. I'm sure there are lots of things they would have said. We would have wanted this to happen but they committed themselves to something bigger. Because my servant Caleb has a different spirit. Now, I like that word alien because in other words, what it's saying is that to his compatriots, to those who left Egypt with him, he was a flipping alien. He, he, he didn't fit the mold that they now expected. And of course you get the whole issue of, hey, we knew Caleb when we were back there in Egypt. It's not the same Caleb now. We knew Moses when he was back there, not the same Moses now. And in the process of that whole construction beginning to change, there was an inability to acknowledge it. Why? Because 
of not having a different spirit. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit, and because of that follows me wholeheartedly, so not just following what they were doing, but following wholeheartedly what the purpose was, I will bring him into the land that he went to when he spied it out. That's another story in Numbers 14. And his descendants will inherit it. There is a fulfillment, there is a joy, there is a promise, there is an outcome, there is a provision, there is a blessing that goes along with this different spirit. But, but the blessing comes when the different spirit has walked its course, when the different spirit has learned how to embrace freedom and live within the bounds of that freedom, still serving the purpose. Even when people were dying around you and there was loss and difficulty, that different spirit kept in place so that this incredible blessing that was coming from inheriting what God had said could be inherited actually fell upon Caleb and his family. So, I said all that to say this, which preachers usually do. It's like, said all that just to say this. Freedom which I am 100% committed to, which I will not go back on, which I will not revert to some of those things that many of you are familiar with because you've walked a long journey with me, that makes the rock not seem like the rock that used to be back when the rock was the rock then, and we've now become a very different people and a very different group, just like Israel, a very different group, a different people, that freedom requires a different spirit. If you don't grab a different spirit, you will never transition to what it is that different spirit will take us to. In fact, what happened to those who were not of a different spirit, they just left. They just died. Now, I know some of you, your brains are working, saying, well, is everybody who's ever not been in the rock and gone somewhere? Go, no, of course, there are exceptions. I'm speaking generally. Preachers have to do. Give me a break on that. But in general, the picture is this. That's why Paul says these things happened as an example. What's the example? We need a different spirit. I need a different spirit. You need a different spirit. But it's in the presence of that different spirit that we are able to accommodate what is happening in this process of freedom that takes us to where God wants us to be. Freedom requires a different spirit. What is a different spirit? Well, why use the word spirit in a context that would seem more driven by rationale and reason? Well, what Caleb needs is just to reason out why all this has happened. What, what, what Caleb needs is just to rationalize that, well, you're bound to lose some people in the journey across the desert. Well, but it's not talking about our ability to rationalize or to reason or to explain. He actually uses the word spirit, not by accident, because what we need is not just a different frame of mind or a different way of looking at things. We actually need a different spirit. One of the dangers that can happen with a communicator like me is I can become convinced that if I can give you a different frame of mind and a different attitude, it'll all be okay. That's a great source of my disappointment. It slaps me in the face all the time to say, well, how did that work out for you? Not very well. Because I, as a person, that would be my means. If I can just get you to think differently, if I can just get you to rationalize differently, you'll all be on board with me and we'll all be happy and we'll go to where we're going. It'll all be wonderful. Follow the yellow brick road. But the word spirit is used particularly and meaningfully. We don't just need a different frame of mind. We don't just need a different way of looking at things. We don't just need a different way to reason things out. You need a different spirit is what Paul's point is. Now, you can't create a different spirit because spirit doesn't come from reason, rationale, doesn't come from extra education or extra brain work. Spirit comes from spirit, and God is a spirit, and those that worship him Worship him in spirit and truth. So, in other words, part of the whole essence of our saying, God, we just need you so much 
and we just commit ourselves into the Father's hands is because true freedom is a spirit and not a state. If we are going to make it, which I believe we are, if many of us are going to make it, which I hope we are, if all of us are going to make it, which I'm not sure, we need to understand that freedom is a spirit and not a state. And if we get the spirit of freedom in our hearts, then what it does, it doesn't make us self-centered, it doesn't make us disillusioned, it doesn't make us die, it doesn't make us leave. What it does, it actually draws us together, that spirit, that same spirit, Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead draws us together and in the spirit of freedom we assist one another and help one another and in that spirit of freedom there is true liberty because now it's not about what is wanted but what is necessary and my heart begins to give in the spirit of Christ to others and to the process and to God himself because true freedom is a spirit not a state. Let me finish with one other verse. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. So if you have a spirit of fear, if all this unsettles you, that you could ultimately define it as a kind of fear, let me tell you something that didn't come from God. Because God has not given us a spirit of fear. But when we have that different spirit, we have a sense of power, but something else. We have a sense of love, and we have a sense of a sound mind, which means that you can have and I can have an unsound mind, which means the mind's working, but it's not sound, right? It's working, but it's not sound. In the same way that Paul started his is, is, is thesis in 1 Corinthians 10, I don't want you to be ignorant of the facts, right? We want the facts that are the facts, not the facts that are not the facts. God has, given a, has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, N- not an not a empirical power that manipulates and dominates, but a power that says, I can make it, I can, I, can, I, can go, I can endure this. There is healing, there is strength in the process. I have the power to make it across this place, this desert, through these circumstances. I have the power in me and also the love. The spirit that is the spirit of difference has within it at all times a spirit of love, which means you understand how to be loved and you understand how to love, and you understand how love operates. Therefore, you will understand when I talk to you about the pain of bereavement, because love understands bereavement. If you don't understand why I should be bereaved, then I would propose this spirit's not present, because love understands and has compassion. Now, now what I'm not looking for is pity. I don't want pity, you know. Uh, that's not the point. But compassion, compassion that goes all ways. Compassion's for people's difficulties and struggles as well, which I feel those struggles, which is why then you have a sense of feeling when stuff is happening, because the love is flowing. It's part of the different spirit and a sound mind. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. That means that there is a spirit that does come from God, but it's not that one. The spirit that does come from God, which I believe is that different spirit, is free of fear, it's full of power, it's expressive of love, and it's sound of mind, and it makes us do what a Caleb and Joshua did, reach the point where we can actually see what all this was about. We can actually see why we made this journey across a wilderness. Isn't it fascinating how much desert and wilderness figures in the prophetic journeyings of God's people. How Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, instead of seeing miracles and signs and wonders and blessing, sees a desert, sees an adversary, has to wrestle with the challenge of, is God really who you said that he is? And are you really who you think you are? Deserts. But this spirit 
takes us across those deserts and allows us to see what it was that we set out on this journey for, what it was that God has promised us, and what freedom ultimately will deliver to us, which the Bible in its language calls it a land flowing with milk and honey. It means the milk of sustenance and the honey of sweetness. I'm believing for a honey time and a milk time. I'm believing there's some milk for our sustenance and there's some honey for our sweetness and that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning, that our morning will be turned to gladness and we'll exchange our sackcloth for joy because in all of this, we are walking into the freedom that God has called us into. It was for freedom that Christ set us free, so let's not become tangled with the yoke of bondage but receive that spirit. So my prayer tonight is that we all of us in great measure will receive that different spirit. The same different spirit that rested in the heart of Caleb. Let that be the same different spirit that rests in my heart and in your heart. Because my servant Caleb had a different spirit, I will bring him into the land that he went to and his descendants will inherit it. I'm believing that for us. Just stand with me right now. Father, as we stand in your presence, as I speak as a representative of this house, I ask you that into every willing heart tonight, there will descend in greater measure than ever a different spirit, that different spirit that you talked about, that is not a spirit of fear, but that different spirit that as it descends on our hearts is a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind to take us the rest of the journey. We thank you for your love and your kindness and your generous heart and your loving kindness. And tonight we pray for all, all who are with us, all who are almost with us, or are almost not with us, and all who are not with us. We pray in absolute sincerity for that same spirit of kindness and love and generosity to touch their lives. We speak blessings. We bless and we don't curse. We love and we forgive and we thank you. And and thank you, Father, pray that we will be loved and forgiven if where we have been and what we have done has caused pain and difficulty and hardship. We need the same thing, but lead us on and take us on in a different spirit. I desire the different spirit in fuller measure And I desire it for our house. So Lord, pour it out tonight. Pour that different spirit into every willing heart that we will leave with that sense that I have a different spirit. And I'm not afraid of freedom because I know how to handle freedom now. I know how to make that work in the context of the kingdom. And we know how not to be afraid of that. And that how now we can self-regulate what once we had to be commanded because it pours out of that spirit of love and generosity and kindness. Lord, let your blessing rest on every life, I pray, that is here because you love us and we love you and I love these people and all they love me as well. So, Father, let it rest, I pray, as you lead us on into all that you have called us to. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so let's live in a different spirit. And see where that takes us, eh? Bless you. All right, enjoy, enjoy your coffee and cake, whatever you have. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support the rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.